we have talked about waves and um, now we're going to talk about diffraction which is something that waves do when traveling waves encounter an obstacle or an opening in a barrier they will bend around it traveling particles don't do this and if we look at um, two slits that are separated in size by a distance that is similar to the wavelength of the waves, then we'll actually see an interference pattern, and that is characteristic of all light waves. And that looks, it looks something like this. So here's, here's the waves. Um, this is representing the crests of the waves. So as they come and they hit this barrier, there's a slit in it. As it goes through, it, it curves, it bends. Okay, so they're not, they're not straight anymore, they're curved. What particles do if they hit a barrier, if they hit the barrier, they just stop or bounce back, and the ones that hit the slit just go straight through and their path is not altered. So how diffraction happens is when we have two slits here, the light from this light source is you know radiating out and so it's hitting both slits that light is in phase because it's coming from the same place and it goes through this slit and then it diffracts and forms new curves and now as those radiate out we get interaction between the two sets of waves we can have destructive interaction where they cancel each other out or we ha can have constructive interaction. So destructive inter interaction on this screen, we're gonna see a dark line and um, constructive interference is gonna make a bright line where the light is more intense, okay? And because that's just not really easy to understand, I have a video about that. It's actually one of my favorite teaching videos. What is light? What is light? Light is what, what is light? Well, that's a good question. That's a, what is light? <laughs> Isn't that an element? Um, light is brightness, I guess. We have auras. We all have auras. Which are light? Yes, they are. It, it lights up the room. It makes it not dark. What's the difference between blue light and red light? The color. It goes in your eyes and then you see stuff. They range from white to red to orange to green. It's like the chakras of your body. Can you see my aura? Uh, no, not particularly right now. Is it too bright out? It's very sunny out here today. Does that make it harder to see someone's aura? Mm, not necessarily. If I was to explain it to a blind person, right, yeah. it would be it would be the difference. Uh, you see nothing whatsoever as a blind person, whereas I see things in front of me. To be fair, the question of what light is is not an easy one. For centuries, the greatest minds in science debated this issue. In the late 1600s, Newton proposed that light was a stream of particles, or corpuscles. He proposed this in his treatise Optics. But at the same time, a Dutch physicist named Huygens proposed that light was a wave. And this debate raged on until it was settled by the experiment I've recreated today, Thomas Young's double slit experiment. To make sure I got the experiment right, I went to the original source. With the help of Brady Heron, I managed to get into the vault underneath the Royal Society in London. There I found Thomas Young's handwritten notes from 1803. I brought into the sunbeam a slip of a card, about 1 30th of an inch in breadth, and observed its shadow, either on the wall or on other cards held at different distances. Besides the fringes of colors on each side of the shadow, the shadow itself was divided by similar parallel fringes of small dimensions. This is an experiment so simple that you can make it at home, and yet so fiddly that I have never seen it before done with sunlight. I was thinking about doing it in a box, like a, like a fridge box. And you can take it out on the street. Taking it out on the street. Could I possibly interview you guys for about a minute? We're doing a science experiment. I have here is an empty box. Mm -hmm. And this is a little eyepiece where we can look in, and this is a hole. And I'm gonna place this slide above that hole. And if you look closely, you'll see that there's two openings. 
very yeah. narrow opening side by side. It's a double slit. Now before we have a look, we need to tilt it towards the sun a little bit. So mm -hmm. we want the sun to hit this double slit directly. What are we going to see on the bottom? Well, the obvious thing you think you're going to see is you're going to see two, two lines. Two lines on the bottom of the box. Two bright bands. Two little lines. Yeah. yeah. I think it'll be one, one line instead of two. I can expect to see the whole box without. It'll probably be a kaleidoscope of some sort. A bunch of colours. Probably, yeah. Rain light, different colours. There, have a look. You expected to see kind of one line. Is that what you see? No. I see dots. How many? It's one circle. Oh, well, there's one. There's one in the middle, strongest. Two on the side. The two on the outside are multicolored. The one in the middle is just white. It's kind of a rainbow. It's a rainbow of color as well. Quite a few colors, and lots of little dots. But there are more dots appearing. I think I can give two more dots, spreading along. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I can see tons of dots now. Not tons, but I can see dots spreading across that way. Either side. Yeah, definitely. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's incredible. And that's just nothing else apart from two slits. Two slits. That's incredible. So all we're doing is we're putting a light through two very narrow slits side by side. So how does this make any sense? There's some kind of principle involved now. The average person is not familiar with. That's the only explanation. Yeah, I'm really confused by it, but I. I'd like to find out why. The people were debating, is light a wave or is it made of particles? So what causes that? Well, if light were behaving as particles, you would expect them to go through each slit and just produce a bright spot underneath. So we would see two bright spots on the bottom of the box. But if light's behaving as waves, then the wave from one slit can interact with the waves from the other slit. I've got a demonstration here on a little pond where we can see this with water waves. I have two sources of ripples which are basically like the two slits. When I create ripples with a single source, they travel out with circular wavefronts. Nothing particularly surprising there. But if I add a second source of ripples, then we start getting an interesting pattern. This pattern is created by the ripples from the two sources interacting with each other. Where they meet up peaks with peaks and troughs with troughs, the amplitude of the wave is increased. That's what we call constructive interference. But if the peak from one wave meets up with the trough from the other, then we get destructive interference and there's basically no wave there. And this is exactly what was happening with the light. When the light from one slit met up with peaks with peaks and troughs with troughs, they constructively interfered and produced a bright spot. But if the trough from the wave from one slit met up with the peak of the wave from the other slit, they would destructively interfere and you wouldn't see any light there. It's light cancelling itself out. This is basically the same as like having two drops of water fall in a swimming pool. That's right. Exactly the same. And then they go and overlap. As this ripple over overlaps with those ripples, yeah. down the bottom, you get a series of, you get like a bright spot, and then a dark spot, and then a bright spot, and then yeah, a dark yeah. spot, and a bright spot. Now there's a slight complication, which is that sunlight is composed of many different colors, and they have different wavelengths. So obviously they're going to meet up at slightly different points. And that's what caused the rainbowing effects as we go further from the central maximum. So these other ones to the right were slightly colored. Yeah, that's not because the, the reds are going to meet up at different places than the blues. And that's all that makes the color differences in different wavelengths. Exactly. That's amazing. So the difference between so the red So there's still that red pen over there and the green, yeah. the green part is just, I'm, I'm seeing it's that it's just different, different, different wavelengths. Wavelength. And that's how we bring in all these beautiful colors all around us. Exactly. That's amazing. I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> oh, good on you. Thanks, Ben. Hey, thank you. I have been enlightened. <laughs> <laughs>
So that demonstrates the uh, wave nature of light. Uh, light also has a particle uh, nature. And we can demonstrate this using the photoelectric effect. So the, a lot of metals will emit electrons from their surface when light shines on them. And uh, classic wave theory attributed this to the light being transferred to the electron, light energy being transferred to the electron, and sometimes it has to build up until there's enough energy for the electron to escape from the metal. In this theory, only the intensity of the light matters, not the frequency or the color. So it predicts that if you use dim light, there'd be a lag time. So you shine the light on the metal, and if the light wasn't bright enough, you'd have to wait a little bit until the energy built up enough to eject electrons. And this is um, an illustration of a photoelectric device. So we have an evacuated chamber here with a metal surface and um, a positive electrode terminal over here. So we're applying a voltage source across this and monitoring the current. So when an electron is ejected, it's going to be attracted to the positive terminal and complete the circuit. And we can measure that using this uh, current meter. So this is vac evacuated, so those electrons aren't gonna run into anything. They're, they're able to just fly straight through nothing to, the, um, to this terminal here. So when you do this, this is the sort of thing that you observe. So this is a graph of rate of electron ejection versus frequency of light. So at low frequencies of light, it doesn't matter how long you wait, there's no ejection of electrons. When you get to a specific frequency here, called the threshold frequency, now you suddenly get a lot of electrons being ejected. If you have a more intense, brighter light, you get more electrons being ejected. A dimmer light, you have fewer, but you still get electrons being ejected. And if you continue to increase the frequency, that doesn't affect the, um, the amount of electrons that are being ejected. So the, the number of electrons being ejected does depend on the amplitude, but the, the energy is not building up because you can wait forever with the low, lower threshold, I'm sorry, lower intensity light at a lower frequency and nothing's gonna happen. So what this tells us and what Einstein proposed that, is that the light energy is being delivered to atoms, to those electrons in packets, they're little packages, right? A packet of light is called a quantum or a photon. So a photon is a piece of light. So that piece of light hits the electron and it either has enough energy to dislodge the electron or it doesn't, right? So if it has enough energy, then it, the electron will be ejected. If it doesn't, the electron will not be ejected. So the energy of a photon is proportional to its frequency. So the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency it's inversely proportional to the wavelength. E equals hc over lambda. C here is the speed of light. So when we look at this, um, the, the low frequency, these are, this is light with lower energy. So the photons here have less energy. It's not until you get to this threshold frequency, now the photon has enough light to kick out the electron. Sorry, it has enough energy. And if you go above that, all of these photons are gonna have enough energy to eject electrons also. Um, I'm gonna come back to that one and that one. So one photon at that threshold frequency has just enough energy to dislodge a single electron. That threshold energy is related to an energy which is called the binding energy, and it's given the Greek letter phi as its symbol. So if you use higher frequency photons, they have more energy. 
the electron absorbs that packet of light energy and now it has enough energy to escape so it uses up some of the energy escaping, but then it has leftover energy, and that energy we see as kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of the escaping photon, uh, escaping electrons, is the energy of the photon minus the binding energy. So this is a little bit like going to Disneyland. That sounds more fun than photons and threshold frequencies. So let's just say that it costs $100 to go to Disneyland. That was true at, at some point in time. So if you go to Disneyland and you have $75, are they going to let you in? No. Well, can't I come in for three-fourths of a day? No. $100. So if you have $100, you can get in, and then you have no money to spend, right? So you're drinking out of the water fountains, and you're not eating all day long, right? What if you go with $200? They take your $100 at the gate. That's the binding energy, the threshold to get in. The electrons are going out. We're going in. No analogy is perfect. What about the other $100? Well, you still have that, right? So now you have spending money. So you can buy maybe hamburger, right? It's your hundred dollars. Just one, just one hamburger, right? But, but that's the idea here. So the, the photon, if it has enough energy or more energy than that threshold, that binding energy, the electron will get ejected. If it's right at the binding energy, the electron gets ejected and it has no kinetic energy. If the photon has more energy, the binding energy goes to breaking loose, and then whatever excess energy there is, is kinetic energy for the electron. So suppose a metal will eject electrons from its surface when struck by a yellow light. What will happen if the surface is struck with ultraviolet light? Okay, so here's a flaw in my idea of skipping those other two examples. Let's just remind ourselves real quick here. So ultraviolet light is over here, past violet, and ultraviolet light is more uh, energetic, has more energy than visible light. So here's yellow, here's ultraviolet. So we're saying if we've got ultraviolet strike, light striking, it's got more energy, so now what's going to get? What's going to happen? No electrons. Electrons being ejected, but having the same kinetic energy as yellow light. Electrons would be ejected, but they'd have greater kinetic energy or lower kinetic energy. It's going to be C. They're going to have greater kinetic energy. The yellow light has enough energy to break them loose, enough to get into Disneyland, but no extra. This has more than enough. So they're going to break loose, but they're also going to have some kinetic energy as they leave. Any questions? Let's go back to those examples we skipped without the answers. Come on. There we go. A 100 watt light bulb radiates energy at a rate of 100 joules per second. The watt um, is a unit of power. Power is energy over time, defined as joules per second. Um, so if all the light emitted has a wavelength of 525 nanometers, how many photons are emitted per second? And just assume three seconds. Okay. So we've got 100 watt light bulb, 100 joules per second. We're gonna ignore the things inside of parentheses and we've got a wavelength of 525 nanometers. So what are we trying to find? Photons, Photons per second. So we'll start by writing some of these things down. We have 100 joules per second, um, which is the same as 100 watts. And then we have 525 nanometers 
and that would be the wavelength. So we're trying to find photons per second. And we've got, this is um, joules per second, this is energy per second, and this is lambda. So, you know, this is kind of a challenging one because this is different than a lot of, well, than anything we've seen before. How much energy does one photon have? Could we calculate that? Yeah, we could, because the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So that would be 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds times 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second divided by our wavelength. If I do this in nanometers, are my units gonna cancel out? No, I've got meters up here and nanometers down there. We need to have the same unit. So I'm gonna pull that little trick of writing what nano means times 10 to the minus nine instead of the, the prefix and then meter. So meters cancel out and the seconds cancel out and I get joule, the unit of energy, which is great because that's what I'm trying to calculate. Six point six two six ee negative thirty four times three ee eight divided by five two five ee negative nine. So that is three point seven eight six three times ten to the minus nineteen joules. That is the energy of one photon. So we can use that as a conversion factor. This gives us joules per second. We can convert joules to number of photons. and then find out how many photons per second. So 100 joules per second, and I'm trying to convert to photons, and I want to divide by joules. So the joules cancel out, and that gives me units of photons per second. So 100 divided by the energy of a photon. So 2.64 times 10 to the 20th photons per second. So this is what we refer to as a critical thinking problem where you are learning the, the pieces that you need to put together, but we're asking you to put it together in a different way. And there's not like, we haven't done a whole series, you know, it's stoichiometry, right? We had, a, we had a pattern, we had a thing we did, right? This is different, right? You have to figure it out. I don't know why it doesn't like to advance slides. Okay, so this is the sort of question that could definitely show up on an exam, hint, hint. Um, arrange 
these three colors of light, green, red, and blue, in order of increasing wavelength, frequency, and energy per photon. And I'm not going to give you the energies, the electromagnetic spectrum. Ah! I'm going to show you how to draw it yourself. Okay? So, let's use purple because it's kind of a friendly color. I'm going to do it at the bottom because yesterday I did it at the top and there wasn't enough space. So, what's the order of the colors in the rainbow? Yeah, Roji Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Okay, the ones next to visible light are IR and UV. UV is ultraviolet, like ultra lord, right? Ultraviolet. Is that going to be next to violet or red? Violet. So this is UV over here. Guess where infrared is? By red. So which of these types of electromagnetic radiation can give you a sunburn? Ultraviolet light, right? So that tells me that this is higher in energy than visible light. Does that make sense? So this end is high energy, and that end is low energy. It's not asking you about gamma rays or anything else. It's just asking you about the visible light in the middle. But we have to identify which end is more energetic. I can never remember except I know that ultraviolet will give me a sunburn in about 15 minutes at noon. So this is higher energy. This end, right, higher energy, and this is lower energy. So now we need to identify, well, which direction is the wavelength increasing and which direction is the frequency increasing? Because it's also asking us about wavelength and frequency. So I'm going to draw a wave that has a short wavelength and a wave that has a long wavelength. And this is not very scientific, but hey, it gets me the right answer every time. Which of those looks more energetic? The top one, right? It's going <laughs> and this one, right? If they're traveling at the same speed, this is high frequency. It's going to hit you more often. But that just looks more energetic to me. Is this a long wavelength or a short wavelength compared to the other one? Short. Okay, so the, the higher energy one, this is shorter wavelength. And this is longer wavelength over here. Wavelength and frequency are opposite, or you can think about these hitting you, going the same speed. This is going to be the low frequency with the longer wavelength. So this is low frequency, and this is high frequency. High frequency is high energy. So we just made up a very basic electromagnetic spectrum. And really all you have to memorize is Roy G. Biff, right? And the rest of it, you can just kind of think out. You think you can do that? You can do that. Yeah. So when we take the exam on this, um, before you look at any of the questions, draw this out on the back, on the scratch paper or something. Because sometimes when you look at a question, your, your brain just does this dump and empties all the information, right? And then you can't do it anymore. So now we can answer the question. We are going of order of increasing. So that's smallest to largest. So we're going from small to big or large. So wavelength. And we, we're looking just at three of the colors. We've got red, green, and blue. Which one has the smallest wavelength? Blue. This is a shorter wavelength, right? So blue has the smallest wavelength, 
And what's next? Green and then red. How about frequency? Which one has the smallest frequency? Low frequency, it's gonna be red. So red has the lowest frequency, next is green, and highest is blue. Green's always going to be in the middle. It's never going to be the highest or the lowest. It's always in between these two. Energy per photon, which is the lowest energy? Red. And so then it goes green and blue. There's questions like this on one of the, um, it might be on the worksheet, it's also on one of the experiments. Here's another question. How about um, in order of increasing speed? Mm -hmm. this, this isn't saying anything about speed though, is it? What speed do all of these things travel at? Speed the speed of light. <gasps> it's the same. The speed's all the same. See, and if we had done that first, then when we looked at this one, we would be like, oh, well, ultraviolet has more energy than yellow. So, oh, well. So we call this the wave particle duality of light. Sometimes light behaves like a wave, and sometimes it behaves like a particle, and the behavior you observe depends on the experiment. 